So um, today I want to talk mostly about the data we use and less about the awesome science we do with it. And as we're in the area of intensive care medicine, our patients usually look pretty much like this, right? They're asleep, in coma, most of them, and they're well monitored. So they have all these devices connected to them that constantly record their vital signs, medications, ventilation status, so some of them can't breathe on their own, so they have to be ventilated. And where nurses and doctors enter documentation on a regular basis and in structured form. So we take this data, plus other data that we have for the patients, such as lab data or patient history data, and push it into an analysis pipeline, where we first prepare the data so we can then do statistical or machine learning analysis on them and plot them to display them on different kinds of devices for the doctors. Of course, like our doctors at Charité don't have head-mounted displays yet, right? But that's where we're trying to go at some point, to provide them with patient-targeted analysis and plottings for the data they have. And we also want them to be able to interact with those analysis even when their hands are dirty and they can't really touch anything. Okay. So today, I especially want to talk about the data preparation step because, even surprising to me, clinical data is really, really dirty and hard to get by. So in our um, department with anesthesia and in intensive care medicine, we're actually pretty lucky compared to other departments of the hospital because we have loads of structured data sitting in databases ready for us to use. So we have intensive care data that I just showed you on the previous slide with a patient on it. We also have anesthesiological data from when the patients are in the operating theater. We also have some routine data that is regularly collected at the hospital and loads of data still that is in free from text, right? Notes that nurses and doctors take and that is nice to consume for humans, but really difficult to consume for computers. Okay, so I'm just going to briefly give you two fun examples of the structured data we use, and then I'm going to get into the unstructured data, because I think it's a really important topic that, as a community, we have to engage more deeply into. So this is a plot that shows the numbers of patients versus the numbers of nurses in single shifts at the intensive care wards we have. So a shift usually is eight hours in total. Every day has three shifts. And we extracted all shifts and compared how many nurses and how many patients were in each ward, right? So every dot is a combination of patient number and nurse number. And up here, you can see um, that we have several shifts where we have like 40, 30, 40 patients with 30, 40 nurses down here. A, lot, uh, a bit lower um, altogether. What you can see at first sight is that it all goes up diagonally, which is characteristic for intensive care wards because you have a very good patient-nurse ratio, right? In a regular ward, you don't have one nurse for every patient, but in intensive care, you usually do. Um, what you can also see is that it um, nicely correlates with the actual ward situation at Charité, where we have one ward with about 40 beds, so the absolute numbers here in the shifts altogether are rather low. And then we have four, five wards with 10 to 20 beds, so you have an accumulation of um, many more shifts down here. One interesting thing that occurred to us when we did this uh, rather simple analysis is that there is also a high accumulation down here. So in the one-to-one -one area, there are 900 shifts where you have exactly one patient and one nurse. That's kind of awkward. I'll just leave it at that. We're quantifying this error right now. Um, obviously, there's something wrong with the data, right? So first glance, nurses just don't enter when they're on shift, right? So we... Um, yeah, if you want to know more about that, come to me in the AMA um, session afterwards. All right, this is awkward. Data is dirty. We have to take care of this when we do want to do an analysis like this. Another example, this is the SQL we use for extracting medication information from our database. So right here, we're trying to extract a certain medication type that is for stabilizing the patient's blood pressure on, in the intensive care unit. 
in the top area, you see a certain subselection of substances that we want to apply. And then all of this down here is like SQL like statements for excluding certain types of application of this medication, right? We only want to have infusions, but this, these, medi these medication types you can also have as a spray or as a pill, other things. The interesting thing about this is that at least these five actually refer to the same application type with a bit more um, variance in your interpretation. You can assign these four too. And I, like yesterday, I talked this through with one of our physicians, and he was like, well, half of this is actually just the same thing, only that nurses who enter this information are allowed to enter freeform text, right? So there's no structure, the data is structured, but it's still super dirty. And of course, now you're sitting there and you're asking yourself naturally, and this is really what we use to predict patient mortality? It's even worse, actually. But, um, and like one fun thing, side note, doctors are, especially intensive care units, were super obsessed with patient mortality, right? I mean, there's so many fun things about patients to predict, to, pr to predict, but patient mortality is the thing. Why is it the thing? I actually was wondering about that for a long time, but it's the thing because it gives you a sense of why, like how sick the patient is, right? How much, how much care does the patient need? How likely it is, it is it that the patient will die over the next couple of days? The more likely it is, the more care they need. Anyways, this is the data that we use to predict that. We clean it intensively, of course, first. Okay. So, moving to point number two, let's look a bit into the patient data space. This is, I would say, one of the most important slides of this presentation. It's a bit overwhelming at first, but I'll talk you through it, so don't get scared, okay? Um, what we see here is, on the left-hand side, different types of data that we as patients generate, not only in the healthcare system, but also outside of it. So it goes from medication, over diagnosis and procedures, genetics, social family history, socioeconomic issues and environmental factors, right? And left and right side of the graphic are structured versus unstructured data. So that's what I said in the very beginning. We have databases with all that structured information, but we have loads of free-form text too that we want to get that inform also want to get information from. So it might be surprising to you that you see Facebook or Twitter here um, on this patient data slide, but if you think of it from a like from stuff you hear from the news, where you have flu predictions from Google search histories, you also have um, studies where um, outbreaks are extracted from Twitter feeds, right? So all this data contributes to what makes you um, a person, a patient, and what contributes to your health data. One and especially interesting aspect here is the blue part where here you have structured data at, at, in the healthcare system, and here you have unstructured data in the healthcare system, and you can see that several aspects of, you, of your health data wholeness are actually not available in structured data. They're only in unstructured data. And altogether, we can say that even today, with electronic health records, with um, um, digital everything in the hospital, most of the data still kind of looks like this. So that's really hard to see with this resolution. So it's digital, but it's still vast, and it's unstructured, and it's, for humans, it's difficult to grasp, and for computers, it's even more difficult to grasp. Okay, let's look at one unstructured data sample. So this is a report of a 12-year-old go old girl who came to the hospital with a certain number of, uh, of symptoms. And what we want to do here to make use of this information is we want to extract all sorts of things. So we want to extract the diagnosis, demographic information, procedures, negations, even things that are not here in this specific snippet. And uh, at, at first glance, this looks like regular NLP, natural language processing. Who of you is in the area of natural language processing? Don't be shy. Awesome. So. If any of you has seen any, something like this before, it pretty much looks like regular NLP. Okay, but it's the clinical domain. 
which is particularly difficult for the following reasons. So typically, natural language processing um, has a number of steps. You, steps. you put in raw text, you run through several um, analysis steps, and then you get annotated text out, such as the text we just saw. And the, these steps can be grouped into e both, um, number one, linguistic processing, and number two, entity-specific extraction, right? So the linguistic processing will do things like um, split your sentences in the text apart. It will do grammar checks, spell checks, part of speech tagging, so identify what, what's the verb, what's the noun, things like that. And the entity-specific steps will actually find the diagnosis, find the medication, find the symptoms, and find out which of those is negated. Okay, so the problem with clinical text is that it often looks like this, right? So this is a bit different from what we just saw as an example. It's a staccato message that doesn't have much grammatical structure. It has a lot of entities in it, but all of these steps up here all the tools we usually use on regular natural language text just fail, right? They don't work because there is no structure or no grammatical structure. And um, then for the second part, we usually use dictionaries, ontologies, or lar large annotated corpora to train machine learning models in order to do the entity extraction, the normalization. Problem is that except for English language text, most other languages do not have a lot of these resources available for clinical data. So for German and for most other languages in the world, this step fails too. Okay. Let's just look, uh, quickly look at the situation from a German perspective. As I said, it's mostly the same for other um, languages as well. So for G German, there's only one model I know of that is openly available to do the linguistic preprocessing on clinical text, right? It's been trained on a corpus in Freiburg. The models are available. The corpus itself is not. So we don't know a lot about the characteristics of the corpus. We don't know how applicable the model is to other clinical texts. And we are not able to do any independent evaluation of the model, right? It's great that it's there, but it's not fully useful. For the entity-specific extraction, um, we have to say that important ontologies that are used in a medical context, such as SNOMED or UMLS, who has heard of SNOMED and UMLS? So those are like the most important um, ontologies um, to identify concepts in medical environments, right? So they're mostly in English. There are other translations to other languages too, but for German, there's currently no translation. Um, or other ontologies that are um, equally important, they just have a much lower coverage, right? So not much use here. Another problem with clinical text itself is that there are so many synonyms and abbreviations, right? So doctors are like the most cool, the most cool species on earth. So they think they have to use their own specific um, terminology for like most anything. And... Um, across different disciplines that holds especially true. So, for example, we have um, the abbreviation PCP, which um, refers to a specific fungal infection of the lung. And um, in one hospital, you will use PCP as the um, abbreviation. In another hospital, you might use PJP, which just refers to a different um, a, a different individual who might have identified this fungus in the lung for the first time, and that's why the name might be different, whatever. Anyways, both of these acronyms are not in ICD-10, which, uh, um, which is one of the ontologies which is actually available in Germany for identifying diagnosis. And this ontology is available in German because it's relevant for billing, right? So everything in the hospital is actually tagged with an ICD code, and then those are grouped into DRGs, and then you can bill them with your healthcare um, uh, health insurance company. Okay. So one more example about this um, specific specialty and institution's um, specificity is alcohol. That's like the most awful thing to detect in clinical text because everybody uses their own secret word, so the patient will not understand what it's all about. So we've seen things like C2, OH, ethyl, ehol, and all sorts of things that as a, even as a human you would not naturally identify as alcohol abuse, 
just so the patient will not know that the doctor is talking about them having alcohol abuse. Okay. Anyways, so summing this up, um, altogether we have no tools, no resources, no corpus, and no gold standard. And even though there are research groups in Germany at um, medical universities that are working in this field, and there are companies who are also working in clinical natural language processing, nobody is publishing their tools, even on request. So we've tried it, but they just don't publish. Anyways, okay, why is it? Why is this? Why is it so difficult? Why, can't, why do we not have an open shared corpus? Of course, it's the patient's fault, right? Or it's not the patient's fault, but it's um, the fault of their privacy, right? So for, for structured data, it's not straightforward, but it's manageable to anonymize their data or de-identify their data to at least start sharing it with other people, right? And for unstructured um, data, for text, that's much more difficult. So if we look at this pipeline one more time, um, this is only half the truth, right? Really, the whole journey starts way on the left, where we have electronic health records. And from those electronic health records, we de-identify and anonymize the texts to then input them into our text processing pipeline, right? And this whole step is natural language processing too, or again, we have no tools, no resources, and no corpus and no gold standard. Okay. So as time is running out, I'm just going to run through this a bit quickly, but this is um, what I think we need in order to improve this situation. I mean, most of the data at hospitals is still text, and if we want to make use of this data, we have to extract it. And if we want to do that, we need corpora. We need shared corpora, big corpora, which are multidiscipline, multi-institution. Actually, I have pictures for this. So multidiscipline, multi-institution that contribute to corpora that can then be used by researchers and companies um, to create tools to identify all sorts of um, different concepts. We need automatic de-identification tools so that we can input text and we will get de-identified text that can then be used, I'll just skip that, it can then be used by different um, group, research groups without compromising data, uh, patient privacy. We need gold standard annotation. So what we find in a clinical context is that we as researchers, we take text, we take it to the physicians, we ask them to use their digital highlighters to highlight those different entities, and that just fails, right? So a colleague of mine has been working for the past two years to get a bunch of clinicians to annotate 200 clinical documents, right? 200. That's nothing that you can really use to do any kind of um, machine learning based extraction on, right? 200, two years. Okay, so that just fails. So what we need here is something that's more tightly integrated into the patient workflow where the doctor actually reviews the annotation that the system does when, while they're seeing the patient and provides feedback in a more semi-supervised way. Okay. We need common annotation data models, which is kind of straightforward, but still, there's a lot of community discourse about how we store annotations on text. We need shared test challenges, so that we, when we have corpora, we actually put them out there, such as Kaggle is doing with structured data and other disciplines. We need that for medical data, too, which is available actually for, um, for English language text. This is all happening, right? But for other languages, it is not. Okay, so we need shared test challenges where we, um, where we publish corpora and people can just take the challenges and um, get onto that data and provide solutions, which should then be opened again. Um, such as we need tools for dictionary enrichment, um, where we actually tackle all this synonym and abbreviation problem, which every group now that is going into this field is doing by itself again, right? Everybody's starting over, constantly starting over with all this stuff, and nobody publishes their enriched ontologies or anything like that. Okay. And last but not least, we need a shared resource library where all these resources can then actually be shared. Okay. That was a bit of a long list. I'm, thank you for bearing with me. Um, okay, why do we want to do this? Not only to be able to analyze all this rich data that we have in the bottom right corner, um, but also to enable new interactions with this data, right? So in the future, we might not want to use our hands anymore. We might want to use one of these devices, not only to interact with the analysis pipeline and tell it what to show and what to, um, what to do, but also to input data into the system, right? We want to use our voice, right? 
so that we can have better patient interaction without having to stare at the computer screen all the time. Okay, so 12 seconds for the take-home question. I, think, I hope I convinced you that we need a way to share data and resources, and some of this is actually happening now, right? So there are platforms emerging, patient um, gaining control over their data, that's all happening. The question to you is, would you contribute your data to such a platform? Would you contribute it so that researchers, companies can start working with this data, start creating algorithms, sharing them again? And if you would, under which conditions, right? When, what would make you do this? What would make you contribute your data and let our researchers to um, use it and to um, create tools for extracting data from it? Thank you very much.